Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon, and I'm going to be speaking about Pointillist history, which is a... Uh, I'm not going to claim it's a new way to do history, but it's a new uh, way to uh, see uh, historical research and how it might, it might be done. Um, it's, uh, good, it's based on uh, Pointillism in European painting, uh, late 19th century, uh, Georges Seurat, uh, uh, Paul Seignac, and others are the founding fathers of this technique. And um, the idea, well, here it is. Uh, there we go. This is uh, this is uh, the. Uh, let me go back here. This is his, this is the most famous uh, uh, Pointillist uh, painting uh, ever made. The, a Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jatte. Uh, by uh, Georges uh, Seurat, uh, and you can see it's a big painting. It's three meters by two meters. Uh, it's at the Art Institute of, of Chicago. And the, the trick about um, a plantilism is that the, the painter doesn't mix colors on the, on the a palette, but rather applies little dots of pure color and builds up images from that. So this is an effort, not a very successful one, to try to show how this technique works. You can see the, the image itself. It's thousands and millions of, of little tiny dots of pure color that the eye then turns into an image. Now, all images are fake, but this is an especially fake image in the sense that the, it's the mind that creates the image out of these little bits of color that are overlaid on one another. And they're also very dynamic. If you look at it up close, there's a lot of movement in them as, as well. Uh, and the technique is something like what your printer does, like a color printer. It's kind of these tiny little, little dots of color and building up the colors as we go. So Plantelli's history, as I understand it then, is an historical account using small bits of evidence to create a larger picture. Okay, so that's what we're going to be trying to uh, detail this afternoon. Now, to advance any further, I'm gonna, I thought I needed to take a quick detour uh, through historiography. And in an earlier iteration of this talk, I had a, this fantastic image, a uh, topology of uh, the historical enterprise. I'm going to splash this up for two seconds and that's all you're going to be able to see it. Uh, there it is. And uh, the point of the whole thing is to pull out of it micro histories and long durée histories out of the world of what historians do. And obviously, Pontelis history is going to be a combination of microhistories and long durée histories. And I need to explain uh, what those are. Now, over the course of, of my career, uh, microhistories have really been fantastic. Uh, it's wonderful sorts of stuff. Uh, Carlo Ginsberg is the uh, grandfather of. Uh, of microhistories, the cheese and the worms, uh, the, uh, the the mental world, evoking the mental world of a, a 16th century uh, Italian baker who actually gets in trouble with the Inquisition. Uh, the Return of Martin Gare by Natalie Zeman Davis, this uh, guy who impersonates, returns to a village after a war, impersonates Martin Gare, gets his wife and his property and so on and so forth, and leads to all kinds of, of trouble. Uh, the Great Cat Massacre by Robert Darton, another classic uh, in this uh, genre. Why did print shop workers in the 1730s round up all the neighborhood cats, including the mistress's favorite cat, and kill them all? And then enjoy playing the game again and again. You know, like what the hell is going on there? Um, uh, here's a more recent one uh, about a, uh, a, a fellow who pretended to be King Sebastian. Missing King Sebastian supposedly died in, or he died in, in a war in Morocco. He came back anyway, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a new one out, relatively new one called Nuns Behaving Badly. It's a really, really nice book. Um, <laughs> The thing about these is uh, they're not case studies. You need to be clear about that, right? They're micro histories. And the idea here is to take one little thing, usually these from law courts, right? these are law records, take one little thing and explore it in, the, in a way that makes, uh, uh, you know, evokes the, the, society, the society and culture surrounding them, right? So, like, like, like Blake's grain, grain of Sand. It's a tiny little thing we're able to see, like, uh, this crazy world of this miller, or this crazy village, 
or these crazy print shop workers, or this crazy um, um, uh, imposter. Okay, so that's microhistories on the one hand. On the other hand, we have uh, long durée history as pioneered. Long durée in French means long time period. Durée is length of time, long durée, long durée histories. Pioneered by the great Annal School historian Fernand uh, Braudel, most famously in his two-volume work on the Mediterranean in the time of Philip, uh, Philip II. Now, Brodel is not interested in microhistories. He's interested in the developments that occur, historical developments, over a longer period of time. Now, this book uh, basically covers the second half of the 16th century, although he's evoking things that go back to Greece and Rome and even further into the 17th, 18th century. Right? Uh, here's another of Brodel's famous works. Uh, uh, Civilization and Capitalism, the 15th to 18th uh, century. So. 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. That's 400-year period where he's tracing the development of capitalism in, in Europe. Okay, so see, it's a really different style of history than micro-histories. Okay. And so then what, what we want to do in Pointillis history is to combine these two. Now, I should go back and say about Brodel, um, he uses all kinds of evidence, any kind of evidence that's relevant to his investigation and his writing, he deploys. Right? Point to these history is not going to be doing that. Okay, so we're looking then at to use microhistories to write long durée accounts, to use microhistorical dots to paint a long durée picture. Okay? Question becomes, what are the dots? And the answer is virtually anything that's going to remain more or less the same over this lengthy period of time. Uh, I'm not a, a, a foot fetishist myself, but I could well imagine a really neat uh, history of foot gear that goes from Otzi, the Iceman, uh, down to Manalo Batik, and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, that is, the thing stays the same. Uh, books also uh, perform this. Uh, the history of the book is itself a separate subfield of historical work. The point, the, the key though is to have what I'm calling standard candles. I'm taking this term from astronomy, which is something that's the same and that we can say over time. These will be our little micro dots. We can evoke a, a, a long durée, a long durée history. Now, I'm not the first to actually do this, mind you, uh, and I'm not claiming to be by any manner of means. Uh, I mean, you probably can think of your own examples, but I go back to uh, Philippe Ariès, a three-volume work in French in the early uh, 1960s called, in translation, Centuries of Childhood. And Ariès's uh, a trick is to take the body of children, the physical body of children, and that's, that's his microdots. Right? And those bodies remain the same from 1200, 1300, 1400, 1500, 1600, 1700, 1800, 1800, 1800 and he catches into the, into the 20th century. Right? And so he's looking at how society dresses them, clothes them, educates them, plays with them, does all this sort of stuff. Now, obviously, the children change, but you get the idea that the bodies sort of remain the same. We might look at uh, Arthur Lovejoy, the father of the uh, history of ideas. Um, as Lovejoy's notion was that there are these unit ideas and we can study them over time. So something like freedom or democracy or happiness become the unit idea that we can study, or the great chain of being in his, his most uh, famous work here. I don't think that works too very well, but um, anyway, it's, it's still the same sort of thing that we can take these little micro dots and look over a long period of time. In preparing this talk, uh, I remember this great movie from the 1990s called The Red Violin, which is a, a cinemagraphical long durée history of the story of, of one violin from its uh, doomed creation in the uh, Renaissance uh, through, to, uh, through to the 1990s. Okay, so, so that's the idea behind microhistory, uh, or excuse me, by uh, Plantilist history. And what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, then, is to illustrate this through a work of my own, of course, uh, which is called History and Numismatics, uh, Old Regime France and its Jetons. Uh, numismatics is coins and coin collecting money, okay? Um, and 
this book, it's being published by the American Numismatic Society. Uh, this book, uh, I wrote it as a, a piece of historiography. That is, I was interested in what could happen to, for early modern historians for whom these literatures, the history literature and the numismatic literature, are completely separate. What would happen if we brought them together? In the case of antiquity, for example, uh, Greece and Rome, ancient history, uh, uh, coins and coinage are very much a part of the historical thing, but not in the early modern period. So I was wondering, when I discovered these two literatures, what we could get to bring them together, and did a lot of work and wrote this thing, and this is the book, and so on and so forth. Only at the end did I realize that uh, I was doing pointillist history, using these things called jetons, right? Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about those, but just to be clear about what they are. These are tokens. I brought a few here. Uh, 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 they're, uh, I'll, we, I don't want to hand them around exactly because I want them back. Uh, 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 but they're, um, uh, we'll, well, we'll see what more what they are. But they have no monetary value. Okay? These are just uh, uh, like uh, subway tokens today we have or uh, telephone tokens, these kinds of things. They're just tokens that were produced, have no monetary value. So we're not talking about money, we're not talking about historical medals or anything like that. Just these, uh, these kinds of, of the particular kind of token. And the argument here is that this particular kind of token becomes our little microhistories, our little dots that are going to allow us to write and create a history of, or a, a portrait rather, of all of old regime France. That is France uh, from 1200 to 1800. Uh, I won't try to justify why one would want to write about France in that period. Trust me, it's really worth, uh, worth doing. Uh, here's one of these jetons. This is a late jeton. This is 1749 jeton of the Academy of Sciences and Belles Lettres uh, of, of Lyon. And it's uh, gorgeous and emblematic of what I have to say uh, this afternoon. Okay, now, uh, these things originated as counters on counting tables. Right? Now, this is a form of doing arithmetic that nobody knows anything about, that's completely dead. It's not an abacus, uh, nothing. Right? Uh, uh, here's a famous woodcut from Gregor Rush's Margarita Philosophica, 1503. We've got uh, Boethius over here on your left, who's doing his arithmetic uh, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division using pen and paper, right? Using the techniques that we all learned in elementary school. That's what Boethius is doing. Over here, we have Pythagoras. Now, Pythagoras is doing the same accounts using a counting table, right? An incised table where jeton, from, from jetare, to throw down, right? So these things, you took a hundred or so of these, you threw them down on the table, and then you manipulated them around and you could do your accounts with it. Right? Uh, again, I've seen looks of complete disbelief, but trust me, uh, this was actually true. Uh, people, uh, people did this, and it was very tricky. So, for a 600-year period then, and the areas we're talking about are France, uh, particularly North East France, England, the Low Countries, Holland, Belgium, and Germany, this count, using the counting table, was the pr primary technology for keeping accounts. Wherever you were keeping accounts, if you were keeping your accounts for your household, if you ran a local bar, if you were a government office, whatever, you, you know, money's going through, you had to keep, uh, keep records, and it's done uh, this way. Uh, some of it lives today, by the way, in uh, our notion of a checkerboard or the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer in England, the Ministry of the Treasury is uh, from this, uh, this same sort of thing. So everything from here on in is going to be based, to begin with, on uh, arithmetic functions and accounting functions. Right? So, like I said, right? here's some representative medieval ones. Uh, there's, this is a so-called school jeton, where uh, you had to learn how to do this. And so grammar schools taught these skills. This is an admissions token uh, to a grammar school. You can see the counting table here. You can see the jeton here. You can maybe make out the Reichenmeister uh, uh, there in the back with a horn book here. Okay. Now, what we're going to see is 
<laughs> what starts out simply as counters on counting tables, oh, and by the way, I should have mentioned that then there's this huge literature over a several hundred year period of books being published on how to do this. So just keep that in mind, too. Um, all right, so step one. Step two is these things then become a perk of office for office holders. Right? Now, they begin around the, the French court. Now, the French court in the 1200s and 1300s didn't amount to a hell of a lot, right? But there's still a few little operations there. There's the king's bakery, the king's wine, uh, the king's stables, the king's furs, and so on and so forth, right? A dozen of these little offices where, you know, money is going through and they have to keep, keep records. And uh, the king was responsible for providing these offices with the jeton that they used to keep their accounts. And what happens is, by the time we get to the 1400s, they become a perk of office that office holders get by dint of holding the office. So every year, like this guy, Monsieur Claude Delacroix, who is a, a royal counselor, master of the Chamber of Accounts, every year he gets 100 silver, now, jetons, right, as a perk of office. It's a little thing. Right? Uh, it come, they usually come with quills, pens, paper, matches, uh, spices, these kinds of things. It's part of a, a package of goodies that office holders received every year. Now, here's, there, there are three places in this presentation this afternoon I want to kind of dip down into uh, the really fine-grained uh, uh, stuff. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, a, royal, a ruling by the Royal Monetary Court. And Delacroix is bringing a case that he, he had to pay 60 shillings to engrave the dies that were struck to make his jeton. And he said, I don't have to pay any of this stuff, right? I have nothing to pay since it was a question of 100 silver jeton due to him by the king on account of his office. And the court agrees with him. Henceforth, forbidden to extract anything from the officers to whom the king owes silver jeton by dint of their office. So now we can see it becomes a, a, another function. Okay. All right. By the time we get to the uh, 16th century, that is, the, uh, the 1500s, these jetons now become associated not just as a perk of office to office holders, but uh, actually the offices themselves. So that, and here the, here's the Royal Monetary Court, here's the Chamber of Accounts, this is the King's uh, Privy Council, and you can see iconographically they all start to, to look alike at this point. And now you've got them for attending meetings. So if you attended the meetings of the King's Privy Council, you would get four or five of these things in silver uh, you know, for, for attending the meetings. And, and these things are struck, by the way, in the tens of thousands. Right? The 10,000 a year are struck uh, for the uh, uh, Privy Council. Uh, we're going to see the Royal Treasury in a second. Uh, you know, almost 30,000 a year are struck. Extraordinary. Okay, so now, now the function is of uh, a jeton de présence to call for uh, getting, uh, uh, attending meetings. Okay, in 1589, this guy, Henry IV, uh, gives up Protestantism, says Paris is worth a mass, and becomes king of France, and uh, founds the Bourbon uh, dynasty. And so for 200 years, Bourbon monarchs rule France, and here they are, Henry IV, Louis the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. It's a 200 year period. And it's in this 200, 200, this is long durée stuff, right? In this 200 year period, uh, we really have this efflorescence of Chateau and Chateau culture. Uh, I'm going to go through a number of ways in which we can see this. One way, not terribly dramatic, is in coronations. Mm -hmm. So this is the coronation ceremony of Louis the 16th. Uh, here, Louis the 16th is here in the back and he's been crowned. Uh, uh, it's at this point that the, the doors are thrown open, um, uh, trumpets sound, cannons go off, doves are released, and you can see these guys, sergeants in arms, are walking around up and down here, and they're tossing gold and silver jetons to the crowd. <laughs> uh, here's, this is the uh, uh, coronation jeton of uh, Louis the uh, uh, Louis, Louis the Fourteenth, um, and you know, uh, inauguration of mayors in different towns, wedding ceremonies. Some of the stuff today, like when we throw confetti at weddings, this is the same same sort of idea here. Okay, now uh, the royal court under Louis the Fourteenth, 
and onward is a very different organization than it was uh, back in the 13th and 14th century. A huge bureaucratic operation, and each little department developed these uh, jetons. There's the king's small pleasures for his perfume and his, um, uh, his violins, the king's stables, the king's secretaries, here's the queen's household, a whole other type of thing. And again, uh, uh, they used to keep accounts uh, and uh, as uh, uh, per perks of office to office holders. And there's another function here that I'll put on the table right now, we'll come back to, is that at New Year's, rolls of a hundred of these things are exchanged among all of these offices. So institutional solidarity develops here around these things. It's, it's completely insane. Okay, now, the court is one thing, the government is another thing. So, uh, you know, the, the French word, you know, bureaucracy is a French word, you know, for a reason. And uh, the, the bureaucracy of government in old regime France is really, of government, is quite extraordinary. So here we have the royal treasury, very nice one from uh, 1742. Here's one from the king's buildings. The hundreds of people work for the king's buildings. Uh, the huge budgets uh, here. Uh, they built Versailles, for example. That's just a, kind of a non-trivial a thing that they did. Uh, where we go here? Here's some other government offices. My, one of my favorites is the Office of, of Vacant Offices. <laughs> Got to keep track of what they're. The Mint, a royal household paying accounts, loan payments overflowing with money and water. Here, the imagery is important. Inspectors. Uh, here's. Um, this is not a direct government agency, but this is for the uh, French colony in Canada. Interesting series of uh, jetons. Uh, well, for them. The military, uh, as we now can see the totality of the military, and we can, we can follow the dollar bills through the military. So here there are two major accounting uh, uh, offices in the, in the army. You can see this with its martial uh, imagery here as well. And by the way, you know, the propagandistic uses of these need to, needs to be underscored as well, because on the, on the obverse, on the front side, it's 99% of the time, you know, a portrait bust of the, of the king. Uh, here's a very pretty one of the, uh, of the Royal Navy. Uh, artillery. Uh, artillery and military engineering. Again, here's Jove. This, we're going to come back to this notion that the, you know, the, the tools that these guys have to think with are that of, of Greece and Rome. Uh, here are the galleys. Okay, now, uh, old regime France, as you know, I'm sure, is divided up into the three estates. The clergy, the nobility, and the third estate. And so, so far we've seen uh, the royal court and uh, government. Uh, being very much part of Jeton culture, but it extends far beyond that. So here we have uh, the, the, the church and the nobility. Um, uh, archbishops, bishops would have them struck for themselves. Uh, every two or three years, the, the Gallican church would assemble to vote uh, taxes to the king. And, and this, this, we might say, the function here is kind of like swag. If you were a you know high up clergyman and you're going here, you'd get a nice little purse of these these things and so forth. This is a, a one a, 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 a chaton struck for a noble family, so the family gets it. Um, you could have it has its cipher on it, so you could tell if you were sending a secret message uh, whether the recipient would know what the cipher is. Um, uh, if you have, if you were uh, running a, a manor house or something like that, you're using it to uh, keep accounts, uh, uh, keep accounts there. And these also function sort of as uh, calling cards. You would hand them out uh, that way. So we can see the uh, clergy and nobility there too. Cities and towns. Uh, here's a very nice uh, Louis the Fifteenth uh, jeton of the city of, of Paris. This is medieval Paris. This is uh, pre Haussmann. Um, the, uh, the, the usage of Chateau in the city of Paris are absolutely extraordinary. And look, and the whole point here, though, is for each of these little things to say, using Chateau, I can tell you the story of the organization and function of the city of Paris. So, for example, in Paris, it's run by a mayor, uh, four aldermen, and 26 councilmen. So it's a council thing. Uh, and, and these are struck, again, with tens of thousands uh, every year. Uh, they're used to keep accounts in the very, the, the city of Paris is a pretty big deal. 
uh, you know, lots of different uh, uh, accounts being kept. Um, uh, there's, uh, there, there are various kinds of meetings. There's meetings of the whole council. There's subcommittee meetings. Every time you go as a councilor, you get them. Uh, if you're a, um, if your son or daughter is getting married, uh, you owe a 20 jeton to every other councilor uh, on the city council uh, in lieu of a big wedding uh, uh, feast. Uh, if you go on an inspection trip uh, to, to look at uh, fountains of water or coal supplies or whatever, you get a, a jeton in this way. Uh, every year these are circulated among other uh, uh, exchequeries, if I can use that term. Uh, the, the most, uh, well, every year they give them out to people who do services to them. So the fireworks guy, the pastry guy, the spice guy, the wine guy uh, gets a package of jetons. It's just like a little tip uh, every, uh, every, every New Year's. The most extraordinary example here is in 1751, um, the City Council of Paris funds and sponsors the marriage, 600 marriages of, on one day of deserving poor uh, young uh, men and women. And uh, they gave them uh, outfits, uh, they had a big party, big fireworks, and jetons were struck for the occasion. Uh, other towns uh, do this as well. Uh, here's a very nice one from the uh, city council from Valenciennes. You can see the uh, secretaries down here writing everything down. Here's the council members here. And there's a chair, empty chair, with the uh, symbols of, uh, of, uh, of, of royalty and of the king. This guy's pointing to it, and so on and so forth. Okay, now I mentioned that these are exchanged systematically, roles of these are exchanged systematically on the New Year's between and among uh, the various offices that we've already spoken about. I think it's very telling. So uh, this is a, a purse. This is from the city of Paris. The city of Paris every year would traipse out, the first of the year, would traipse out from Paris to um, uh, Versailles or um, Fontainebleau, wherever the king was, and present the king and other members of the court with rolls of its jeton. And this is, I mean, how these things got made is another story as well. Um, uh, but the, uh, there would be 100 gold jetons in a roll put in here, and this would be put in another purse, right? And that would be handed not to the king, because you don't hand things to the king, but to the king's guys, and, you know, there you go. Extraordinary. And, oh, by the way, apropos of, of micro dots, we know that for Louis XV at least, he, he took his gold jetons that he got every year, melted them down, and made dinner plates out of them. So Louis XV is eating dinner off of gold plates that originally came from Paris from the gold there. So, okay. Oh. Uh, I don't know. It, you know, it just gets weirder and weirder for me. <laughs> what can I say? It, it, they turn into this crazy parlor game for wits. Right? And this goes on for 150 years. Right? Now, um, every year, these are the so-called administrative jetons. Uh, right? And every year, this thing called the Mercure Galon, basically the, the New Yorker of its day, would publish a copper plate engraving of, these are all the new jetons for the year. The, these are the reverse size. Right? The, uh, 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 and the question became, what is going on here? Right? The, to, to, to try to unpack them became this parlor game. So I've got this one example, which I happen to know about, but otherwise they're, they're completely opaque. Uh, uh, this is the 1603 uh, Chamber of Accounts Chateau, for 1603. And we have a naked couple on an island with lilies growing on it and ships running around it. Okay? And the Latin, stat prole hoc altera delos, and consulting my notes, another delos is established by this birth. You try and figure it out. I won't, you won't know. Uh, oh, the Delian League. Huh? The Delian League? No. Oh. Delos was the mythical birthplace of Apollo and Artemis by offspring of Zeus and Leto. And, and this commemorates the birth, the previous November, 
of uh, Elizabeth of France, the first child of uh, Henry IV, Henri IV, and Marie de Medici. So now that we've got Henri IV, they're making babies and they're establishing a new Delos here, the, the home of, uh, of Ar Apollo and Artemis. But Delos is where they kept the treasury of the Delian League until they moved it to Athens. That's so right, that yeah. There must be a connection there. Well, I mean, it's just it's it's this this mythical birthplace of these you know of Apollo and Artemis. That's I mean who knew? But it, and if you if you could figure it out, you won glory. Right. Okay. Okay. Now, I hope this is of some interest to you, uh, uh, but you can see the power of Pointillis history. That's my that's my point here. Uh, now we move out to provincial estates. Okay? Now France is not a country or a nation uh, in, you know, through the end of the 18th century. It's this agglomeration of these various different little provinces. And some of the outlying provinces in particular had uh, uh, these institution called uh, the estates, which was a union of the, of the three estates of the province, the clergy, the nobility, and the third estate of that province. And they had certain uh, prerogatives in terms of taxation and allocating taxation and, and collecting uh, monies and so on and so forth. And they struck their jeton uh, regularly as well. Here's a very nice one from uh, 1770 of, of Brittany, of Burgundy, Languedoc, uh, the Artois. Not every province strikes them, but many of them do. And they perform these same kinds of functions. They're accounting functions, they're perks of office, they're for attendance, and they're spread around at, uh, at the at the, at the new year. Now, I, I want to jump down one more time, well actually two more times, but the next time here. Uh, some of these um, um, estates had a right to every two or three years to present their uh, a report to the king, or the cahier de Doléans. It's not really a complaint, but sort of like a, a provincial report. Uh, and here's the, here's the report of the so-called Voyage of Honor uh, of the uh, Estates of Burgundy in uh, 17, uh, 1737. It doesn't exactly mention Jeton here, but believe me, uh, Jeton are all over this thing in terms of arranging for this meeting and for what happens afterwards. But in terms, again, of a little vignette about uh, the organization power of old regime France, this, to my mind, is really, is really telling. And this is my paraphrase of, um, of the archival original. A royal audience is arranged for Versailles for Monday, June 10th, 1737. It takes about nine months to arrange this meeting. Accompanied by the governor general, the representative of the clergy dons the long robe with a hood. The representative nobleman wears his ordinary clothes. The third estate sports a short cloak and ha co uh, gloves and hats are specified. Two royal masters of ceremonies usher the group into the hall reserved for receiving ambassadors. The king, Louis XV, is seated in a chair in front of the fireplace, his major ministers by his side, bodyguards and gentlemen attendants nearby. The governor general makes three profound reverences and introduces the delegation to the king. Everyone takes his assigned place and uncovers. The king takes off his hat, keeping it by his side. The third estate representative, the syndic, the lawyer, and the treasurer kneel before the king. The two other estates remain standing. The clerical representative makes a short speech and passes the Burgundian cahier to the king, who says just a word and immediately hands the documents to his ministers. After the further bows, the party retires. That's it. In my mind, if you get that on film, you, you, you're saying a lot about how old regime France actually worked. All right, uh, moving on. The academies. Uh, there are any number of, of royal academies funded by uh, the king and Jeton play a very important role in the, their functioning, uh, mostly as Jeton de Présence. Um, here's one for the uh, uh, Académie Française, the first one, uh, 17, uh, 1635. Here's some other ones, the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Letters. Of sciences, surgery, the surgery academy also incorporated the guild of surgeons. We'll talk about guilds in a minute. We'll say something about that. Painting and sculpture, Chetons are handed out as, as prizes, uh, quarterly prizes to the best art student uh, or sculpture student or architecture student uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the quarter. 
uh, Academy of, of Medicine, Architecture, Agriculture, Naval Science. All of these are in Paris except for this one, which is up in Brest for other. But these are all official royal institutions. Um, I put this one here in blue to, to signify that all of the Chateau that we've seen pictures of here so far, um, uh, except for the medieval ones, all of these pass through the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres. They design every chaton that we've seen. So everyone with the king here, uh, this inscription, this inscription, whatever is here, is specified by the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres. And uh, people who are interested in the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres uh, you know, now know a lot more about how that institution, very important institution, uh, ran at the time. Okay. Uh, the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, a whole other series of jetons, very important jetons, for 150 years. The Faculty of Medicine is this incredible institution. It's part of the University of Paris, and it's independent. It's not controlled by the king. It's not controlled by the t town. It's not controlled by the church. It's completely independent. And uh, it, it elects the doctor's regent of the Faculty of Medicine, elect their own dean, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, every uh, every couple of every two years, I, the dean is in the back, uh, 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 and he can be reelected twice uh, or once rather. So he can four years, and they strike again thousands of these things, and they're used uh, quite systematically in the functioning of the faculty of medicine. So uh, there's a required weekly mass you get one for. There's a required monthly meeting to discuss uh, reigning diseases. Uh, if they didn't do it, but if they did do it, uh, doctors are supposed to give free medical advice to the poor. They got chaton uh, uh, for that. Uh, you got chaton for going to funerals or visiting the fa family of a deceased uh, doctor regent. Uh, so, so. And the lawyers for the faculty of medicine got a lot of these things because they're involved in a lot of law, law stuff as they defend their, uh, defend their turf. Okay, next and quickly, uh, provincial academies. There are 28 provincial academies in France by the time of the uh, of the French Revolution. Uh, not, most of them do not have jetons uh, struck because they're just too expensive and these are uh, you know, uh, delicate little things. But many do. Here's again this one from Lyon. There's Bordeaux, Nancy, Rouen, Lyon, Toulouse. And uh, they're, uh, the, here the, the distinctive function is they almost function like dues somehow. Like, you know, these are... They, they, they sometimes get subsidies from the towns, but most of them, their, their, their members are paying for it themselves. So you would pay, you know, 60 pounds a year to be a member, or you had to be elected, but you pay 60 pounds. But then you would get jetons uh, uh, for attending meetings. So it's a way to encourage uh, meetings. Here's my favorite of the uh, provincial academy uh, jetons, the so-called Circle de Philadelphia. Uh, and this is this is a the Royal Society uh, that's founded in uh, in Colon in the Caribbean in colonial Haiti in 1784. I know nobody it's unbelievable it's a, a story. This is the world's largest and most important uh, overseas colony in the world at the time, and some of the uh, white guys down there decide they want to set up a learned society, sort of like uh, the provinces, and they get official recognition in 1784. And in 1788, uh, uh, in 1788, they become the Royal Society of Sciences <coughs> and Arts, if people say, and they have this jeton struck for themselves. Um, and back in, in Haiti, or Saint-Domingue, you know, they're handing them out to their members, uh, to the governor general and the governor general's wife, and the attendant and the attendant's wife, and so on and so forth. And it's got this especially ugly uh, image of uh, Louis the Sixteenth. There, he's he's 34 years old uh, at that at that point in time, and you know doesn't have that much further to go. Uh, the, the, one of the things about this, though, is this: this is the youngest learned society in France, and it, a science society, and it connects with the Paris Academy of Sciences in Paris, and they form an actual union of these two institutions, and that union is symbolized in a meeting where there's this exchange of jetons to sort of commemorate uh, commemorate this. Okay, uh, the guilds. Now, uh, you know, we've got to disabuse ourselves of the notion that uh, there's free enterprise in old regime France. There's no free enterprise in old regime France. You can't set up a shop if you want to. 
Right? Uh, everything, uh, you know, the, the means of production are controlled by uh, corporations, by the guilds. Mm -hmm. And the guilds really get into Jetan. We can see the whole world of the guilds through uh, uh, Jetan. Here's some representative. I could show you hundreds of these. Uh, you know, there, uh, you know there, there are 120 different guilds in Paris. Same thing in Marseille. Same thing in Bordeaux. Every little trade is divvied up into uh, its, its, its little practice. So here's printers and booksellers, corduroy makers. And again, we see the same uh, sort of thing. Keeping accounts, attending meetings. Um, here, there's a, each of these has a religious confraternity associated with it, and uh, jetons play a role in that. But the, the really novel thing in the guilds is the role of jetons in initiation. If you want to become a member of the guild, a guild master, you have to go through this elaborate, first of all, you've got to finish an apprenticeship. You have three years of companage out in the world doing, then you come back and you present yourself, and uh, you have to be examined. Excuse me, uh, jetons changes, change hands at this examination. And then there's a big uh, ritual ceremony. So you owe, if I'm going to be a member of these guilds, you owe a jeton uh, to the priest who's accompanying you to Mass. You, know, you owe jeton to everybody else in the guild, uh, depending, you owe jeton all over the place. And you owe a big dinner at the end where uh, you know, the meat specified, the bread specified, the, everything is uh, uh, completely uh, specified here. Here's my favorite um, uh, uh, jeton of uh, Gil Jeton. This is the community of distillers and schnapps merchants. And here we have uh, St. Louis, uh, Louis the Ninth, 13th century uh, king of France. And he's praying to the Holy Spirit. Right, you can see the dove, the Holy Spirit is coming down here. And here he is praying to the Holy Spirit. And the Latin says, Totem in spiritu in corpore nihil. Everything is in the spirit, nothing is in the body. But of course, what do we have here but a still? <laughs> and these are, these are the schnapps merchants. These, the, you know, these, these are giving us the hard stuff. So it's, it's a really nice pun on, on that. Okay. Um, chambers of commerce. Uh, again, related to the guilds, we have this notion that, uh, oh, uh, you know, the triumph of capitalism here. Right? The tr capitalism does not triumph uh, in 18th century France. It's a completely marginal activity and completely clear here in the history of, of, of chambers of commerce and uh, the way they use uh, jetons. Uh, the aging, dying Louis XIV uh, permits these things in the first decade, of, originating in the first decade of the 18th century, 1702, 1703, 1704. Uh, they're... they're not quite like chambers of commerce like we might think of it, but close enough. Okay? But the, the thing about him, these guys and their jetons, is they're so completely peripheral that there's, they're, they're just begging for recognition and support and whatnot from the real powers that be. And they use jetons as a way to uh, uh, ingratiate themselves uh, you know, a, to the local governor, a gold jeton in a moleskin box with little silver and gold nails and his insignia on it. Say, oh, please, please help us. You know, uh, it really doesn't work. Okay. Now, there are areas where we don't see uh, uh, jetons. So this Pointe-Lys history is like, you know, there's some blank areas too. I really don't want to dwell on it. We don't see them in universities. We don't see them in parliaments, which are kind of law courts around. We don't see them in certain regions. Uh, Oh, uh, we don't see them in the pet with the peasants. We don't see them in the village level. Uh, we don't see them for the third estate per se, but in the academies and in the bureaucracy, you know, third estate members are having a lot to do with them. So finding nothing is finding something, and that's uh, I think a, a contribution. Okay, uh, I want to. We're, we're nearing the end here, so if you bear with me. I want to say something briefly now about the manufacture of these things. Every one that we've seen here so far, again, excepting uh, the medieval ones, were struck at one mint. Uh, this mint here, it's on the Seine, Seine River. If you know France, here's Paris, this is the Tuileries Gardens here, here's the Louvre Palace here, and uh, Along the, the, so the, the galleries of the Louvre, here we have the Monet des Médailles here, 
right next to the royal press, royal presses. So this is really high-tech stuff. This is the most advanced mint in the world at the time. Um, uh, a fine art mint. Um, oh, I, I guess I want to say, you know, there, there are dozen, two dozen other mints spread around France that are banging out coinage, right, like money. Right? And the quality is really poor. Right? These, this is really a different, different sort of thing. Now, uh, like I say, this, this leads us into the technology of, 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 the, of the era. And this, again, is uh, like really cutting edge uh, technology. Uh, this is the so-called uh, well, the coin press, the balancier. This is from uh, D'Alembert and Diderot's encyclopedia. Uh, and the, the story of how you get from instructions from the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Letters to actually, you look, you've got to have dies here. Somebody, these engravers have to cut these dies, and then these guys have to do it. And it's very dangerous work. Here. People lose fingers, and it's hot, and really quite interesting. But the, 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 the story of the technology I mean, look, these things, I mean, they're tiny, they're like the size of a quarter, right? And this exquisite kind of detail on it. The engravers who, uh, who did this uh, had a very interesting and important status. They're usually members of the Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Uh, they're referred to by their last names and not their first names. Other workers here are referred to by their first names. Uh, they, uh, and the, uh, they have a, a certain uh, a real, real status. And I want to almost conclude here with this, this concept of them as fine art objects. Right? In French, they're known as petit monuments, little monuments. Right? And what it takes to, uh, to achieve something like this, this is a blow up of, again, the one we've been seeing all along here, of the Lyon Academy. The, Lyon is at the confluence of the Rhone and Saône rivers in France. So here's, here's the Rhone River here. Here's the Saône River here, flowing their waters. Lyon, the lion, 1749. And this one's signed by Benjamin Duvivier. Many of these are signed. We know who, you know, the artist who did this. These are also exhibited, not every year, but, you know, three or four times a decade uh, at the Salon, the art salon in France. Uh, and here's an especially pretty one of the, for the Academy of Sciences, Minerva, again, Harking back to ancient Greece and Rome, sometimes with a uh, with her owl and uh, the instrumentarium of uh, of science around her, including the uh, Royal Observatory in the back. Here's my favorite one of these. This is uh, artillery from 1731. And the thing about this is, this is a scene from the future. The, and these guys, you know, they don't know what's coming. They don't know about the French Revolution. They don't know about industrialization. They don't know about the 19th century. They don't know about Donald Trump. They don't know any of this stuff. What they know and think of is harking back to antiquity. The images, the, the, the tools to think. This is a point Peter Gay made, uh, you know, 500,000 years ago. So in this image, we have it. It's set in the future. And we have two shepherdesses here, we can see, right, on a little stroll down here. And they come across this, this cannon. This is from the artillery. You know, cannons, cannonball of gunpowder, and carts and stuff. And like, it registers their surprise. Oh, 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 oh. And the Latin is a muta minantur. And silent they threaten. And like, this, to me, you know, not only is a... Is a a wonderful piece of art, but I think it's telling about the mentality of the times. Okay, now, of course, all of this comes crashing down by the French Revolution marks the end of ev everything we've talked about. No more jetons, uh, no more royal insignia, no more counting tables, no more perks of office, no more attendance at meetings. It's all gone. It all crashes down, beginning in the uh, 14th of July. One more little thing I want to draw your attention to, though, before we quit. The, the uh, 14th of July was one thing, the October days was another thing. Right? The October days happened in October when the women of Paris come out from Paris and they get Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and bring them back to Paris. This is where Marie Antoinette says, what do they want? They want bread? Well, let them eat brioche. Right? This is uh, some stills from uh, uh, Sofia Coppola's movie, um, 
of Marie Antoinette, really terrific movie. And the movie ends with the October days. And now it's not the end of the French Revolution per se, it's got a few more years to unfold, but still, you know, metaphorically speaking, it's the end of all of that stuff, all the stuff that we've already, already seen. And here's my last bit of, of, of micro dots. As I'm in the archives, turning pages, boring, boring, one day, boring. These are a bunch of receipts from the royal uh, building, office of royal buildings. And I'm going to come across this one. And it's dated the 30th of October, 1789. So it's dated three weeks after the October days. So Louis XVI is now back in Paris in the Tuileries Gardens. And here, what our micro hit dots allow us to see is his mentality at this point in time in the French Revolution. Because he's sitting there, well, you know, I'm back here, da 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 And what does he think about? He thinks about his own jeton. Right? And he's, he's concerned enough about his jeton that he wants to hand them off to safekeeping. And what this is, is a receipt given to someone in exchange for Louis XVI's collection of jetons. I'll read it, but it's, you'll see it's a pretty crappy collection of jetons. It really doesn't amount uh, to too much. Inventory of purses and jetons that were given to me. We don't know who the me is. On the part of the king by Monsieur Thierry, head of the king's buildings, 30th October 1789. Thirteen purses, each containing two rolls of octagonal jetons. Note I've not unrolled the rolls. One purse containing 100 jetons of the same shape for the city of Paris for 1780. 100 of these for 1784, five years before. Five purses containing 100 round jetons of the king's secretaries. And then a bunch of empty purses. One, Eleven velvet purses embroidered with silver thread. One purse embroidered with gold and silver. One purse of gold fabric. Eight purses of calfskin. But he cared enough that he, he wanted to make sure that they uh, got shared and preserved. Okay, so uh, 17 August 10th, French Republic. January 93, off with his head, uh, kind of end of story. Um, again, uh, there's, if we had some time, another talk perhaps is what happens afterwards. Another talk might be how the hell I ended up involved in this crazy topic and you know, giving this talk today, it's an insane uh, story there. But most importantly, uh, I, I know I lost some of you along the way, but uh, I'm you know, trying to uh, show, uh, again, most importantly, how we can do Plantelis history. How, using, taking one tiny little dots and over a long period of time, we can tell, in this case, the story of old regime France from uh, 1200 to uh, 1800. And I thank you for your attention. To what extent did the Jeton act as a kind of shadow currency? So if, if you were, uh, if you had a few of them in your pocket wherever you were, and you were at a tavern and you wanted to pay, and you didn't have money, could you offer them? Not that the I know of. of the metal at least? Yeah, well, that's true. You could, you know, uh, the, 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 the price of silver is highly controlled. There's no free market in silver either. So you know exactly what these things were worth, and you could hand them in for, you know, real money. Right? Yeah. But as far as I know, I've never run into an instance where somebody's actually involved in an economic transaction using jetons. But there must have been people who collected them all or collected as many as they could, right? Oh, don't get me started on collectors. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a whole other story. I mean, these things are starting to be collected from the 17th century. And this, this amazing literature, uh, that's, that's what's prompted this, this amazing literature, you know, for you know, a, a high, you know, a very erudite literature for several hundred years now. Dean. So then these don't have exchange value in all regime No. Nope. There are coins that do have exchange value. Absolutely. That function in the, Absolutely. Know, according to the thing. Absolutely. Value, yeah. You know, abstraction yep. and so yep. So so these things have value because if I get this thing from uh, one of the third estate lawyers or something, it means I've done this thing or participated. Right. So I mean that they have a kind of cumulative there's kind of a cumulative pointer to status or whatever. Absolutely, oh, absolutely, so, correct. Absolutely. So, I mean, these little things don't really have, it's not easy to conceptualize them kind of 
ex post facto. It's not, it's not easy to even kind of think about what, how you think about these after this epistemic break. That <laughs> Tell me about it. Absolutely. <coughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around what these things do. <laughs> exactly. And by the way, the uh, the inspectors, uh, the port inspectors in 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 Marseille, right, who are volunteers, right, got Jeton from the king, and he wanted to give them money, and they refused because it was dishonorable for them, you know, to take money for this job. It was a, uh, an honorary thing. I, I want to follow up on on that to comment question. It seems to me that historians ultimately have to make these arbitrary choices about what to consider to be the, the parts, the elements of their story. They want to talk about a certain period in a certain place. And, um, you know, what do they highlight to try to help us understand that? And you mentioned a couple of possible topics for a pointless history, like, like shoes. Yeah. But shoes have a function. We all understand, you know, shoes do something. Yeah. It seems to me that you sort of have perversely chosen something that has no function. That's not true. They had all these functions I've articulated yeah, left and right. But very, very sort of symbolic, abstract functions. Yeah, well, you know, well, screw you. you. No, no, but, I, <laughs> but I'm saying that, that I think that's a kind of wonderful thing that, that you've, I don't know if this is your intention, but I feel like you're highlighting the arbitrariness of all... It's a complete accident. I just ran into these two literatures that were completely separate, and I said, what can we get to this? And then at the end, I discover I'm doing Pointillist history. That was, that's the conclusion. I didn't start out to do Pointillist history. Like most, you know, historical works, the real story is, you know, what you see last is the, it's not the first thing. I'm following up on what Callan said, and I was trying to conceptualize what these things do. I mean, sometimes you get them, it's almost like an award, maybe, when we get an award for, for like, 10 years at Steam, you get a piece of paper which is not worth anything. In ancient France, it would have gotten a chiton, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I also have to give them at some point, so there's some kind of exchange value. So some people pay with them, or you have to give them to some Oh, but you, you can't, as an individual, unless you're a noble, you can't get them on your own. You can't, you can't say, I want jeton, mm -hmm. right? So they're all done through institutions. That's what allows us to see this institutional history. Right? And those are paid for out of the budgets of those institutions. Yeah, okay, but, but then I, so let's, let's say I give, get that as, as a professor, I get a shit home. Would there be an occasion where I give it to someone, like right? a meeting with... I mean, you could, there? but... The, no, the, I mean, it, it, they're, they're given also, they don't just receive, they're also given. They're, 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 they're given to the king, the city gives them to the king. So it's like a tribute. Right. So it, that's right. almost like, like, like money that you get. So they're all trying to turn it into money. Yeah, it's not money. But yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't just, unless you're a collector, right? I'm a collector. I could say, here, here here's one of these for your collection. That happens, okay? But, you know, they're, they're usually exchanged in rolls of a hundred. So the not as individual uh, 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 chateau. Yeah, but what about you? Let's say I get a hundred of these things that's from, from my unit, from whatever academy. So what do I do with them? So, so who can I give that to? You, well, you can trade it in for uh, in for silver and, and, and get money for it. Okay, that I can do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. True. I mean, uh, D'Alembert, you've heard of uh, yeah. D'Alembert. He was famous as a jetonnier who went to the meetings of the uh, Académie Française in order to get the jeton. He was so cheap that... But, but it would not be when I go to, to a surgeon who's very renowned that would give a, one of these... A roll of hundreds of the silver. No, no, I've never heard of anything like that, right? I mean, the, the, the big pieces of silver, the AQ, you know, you have a bag of them, you hand them out. And that's, that's real money. These are not real money. Yeah? Further to John's point, I just think it's so indicative of, and Kellen also, the status and the snobbery and the mentality at the time, I mean, what was more important, often currying the favor of, right, particularly sanctioned by the court. Yeah was the single most important yeah. motivator yeah. or honor, yeah. you know. But I wanted to talk about, you mentioned when they started putting the faces on as kind of a propaganda thing. Oh, absolutely. When I was researching my dissertation on political marketing messages, it, um, I learned that uh, at the time, and this was a long time ago, Caesar is attributed to the first practice of such things. 
Oh to no, I think it goes a long way further back. Around the no, 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 no. It's uh, ancient, ancient Greece. I mean, uh, even for oh god, no, yeah, Persia. Every you know, okay. you know, they're stamping the you know the king, the emperor's face on all of these sorts of things Thank all you. along. Yeah. I have a question about the the magazine, the New Yorker thing. Oh yeah, code. yeah. Because all of the stuff that you've been talking about, who would actually see these? It seems like very few people would see more than a couple of these, right? It, you have you you might know the one that your institution made, yeah. Or you might be the king and get like yeah. a big fat pile of them or something. Yeah. Yeah. But like the odds of any individual is this right having like a bunch of different ones from all over the, the country would be low, and so you wouldn't know what every ministry did. But these magazines would sort of democratize that. Is that a like little bit, that's right. That? Yeah, I, I, that's 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 certainly that's certainly not wrong, right? It would popularize them, and then uh, at the beginning, the editor. The, the, the next number would give the answers to to what it was, so you could... I just wonder if there's a funny status thing going on there, in the same way that, like, the New York Times style page has all sorts of things that I will never own in it, yeah. right? And yet, <laughs> we read these things mm -hmm. and get mad, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? But we read these things so we can participate vicariously in this weird world of the rich and powerful. Yeah, absolutely. But it's still you know, very esoteric. Sure. Sort of thing. I mean, you know, you've got to be... Uh, I, the the Mercure Galant has things of, of weddings and the king's travels and some poetry and all kinds of uh, of stuff in there. But it it does have that. I would accept collectors because right? this this there are avid collectors by by um, by eighteen by seventeen hundred. Uh, you know, one guy's got three thousand five hundred different ones of these. And the, the, the modern catalog of these, by the way, uh, has uh, something like fifteen thousand different ones. That were uh, that were struck, and you know, the numismatists, coin coin guys, you know, love this stuff. I mean, from the 17th century on on down till today, there there's stores in Paris that specialize in you know, selling these things. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering, are you coining the term uh, as far as I, yeah, oh, you got good pun, good pun. You got me, you got me. As far as I know, yes, I'm, I am, I am coining the, the term uh, point of least history, and uh, you know, maybe I should uh, uh, copy it. But I'm not the first to do it, right, by any manner or means. I mean, I think it's it's a neat technique, you know, and it's something that people ought to have in their armamentarium of historical uh, techniques. And it's never been sort of brought out this way before. And that's what I'm trying to do uh, in this uh, you know, in this talk. I mean, admittedly, you know, using a lot of detail from old regime France, which you know has varying degrees of interest uh, 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 in general. Uh, but yeah. So it seems to me that you're analyzing the history of the Ishtar because you think they reveal something about the larger kind of power. <coughs> Constellation of power relationships, sexual state. Absolutely. So I couldn't help thinking of Marcel Mauss's work in Tris Tropique about the role of the gift in like Micronesian cultures. The exchange of gifts mm. often mm -hmm. was a function of you know social status yep. and power. And yep. so you, but weren't these mm. these things were exclusively made out of gold or silver, not base metal? Oh no, no, base metals too. You know, I mean, very few gold ones, a lot of silver ones, and the base metal ones were the ones that were used on the counting tables. Okay. You know, uh, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, the, the symbolic notion of these exchanges is is absolutely key here. So, for example, in the Academy of Inscriptions and Bell Letters, uh, because they're the ones that every year approved, you know, the the design for the jeton for all of these bureaucratic offices. Those officers then would send to the Academy of Inscriptions and Bell Letters a roll of a hundred. Right? Which were then divvied up among the academicians, but in 1710 or 1711, they didn't do it, and like the uh, the academicians were a little pissed off that you know we didn't get these rolls of 100 uh, from all of our uh, our uh, clients. Um, so yeah, the, it's the symbolic messaging and and the status that one had, in it, uh, you know, was something. Okay. okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.